if you'll turn into the book of Romans, chapter 1. Book of Romans, chapter 1. And stand for the reading of God's Word. I'm going to read verses 1 through 7 this evening of Romans, chapter 1. <clears throat> Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom are ye also the, uh, the called of Jesus Christ, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we can come before your throne this evening. We can come into your house. Lord, I ask that you open up our hearts, our minds, our eyes, and our ears. Everything that's going on in our lives, Lord, will be gone, that we can just hear your word and hear you speak to us. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for the opportunity that we can come and worship you in one accord. Lord, we love you, and we thank you. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Is there a heart or bound by sorrow? Is there a life weighed down by care? Come to the cross, each burden bearing, all your anxiety leave it there. All your anxiety, all your care, bring to the mercy seat, leave it there. Never a burden he cannot bear, never a friend like Jesus. No other friend so willing to help you, no other friend so quick to hear, no other place to leave your burden, no other one to hear your prayer. All your anxiety, all your care, cling to the mercy seat, leave it there. Never a burden he cannot bear, never a friend like Jesus. Come then at once, delay no longer. Heed his entreaty, kind and sweet. You need not fear a disappointment. You shall find peace at the mercy seat. All your anxiety, all your care, bring to the mercy seat, leave it there. Never a burden he cannot bear, never a friend like Jesus.
Amen. Romans chapter 1. I remember um, being a child before the internet came out that my mother used to take us to the library. You remember going to the library and you seeing all those books? Man, I love that. And uh, it just seemed like there's so much information and all the colors, all the different things. And I just, I remember, too, we had um, a day or a time a couple months during the school year in elementary and middle school where the, we'd be able to order books or go out and sell things, try to get books, or the AV bus would come by and um, sell books. And man, I was... I was so happy, and I remember one of the very first books I ever got in school was Super Fudge by Judy Bloom. See, I remember the author, too, Judy Bloom. And, <clears throat> but books have incredible power. I don't think we read enough books anymore these days. You know, we get behind the, the computer or the tablets, and we download things on a tablet. I have books on my tablet. Because it's just easier to carry. I can put a bunch of books on there. I can read it as I'm flying. I can read where I'm going, this and that. But it's still not the same as opening a book, a book and being able to mark it and so forth and seeing those worn pages. I mean, if you look at my Bible right now, most of you would probably say I need a new one. I've had this for this one Bible for 12 years now. And uh, I remember ordering it. <laughs> and, um, but no book has a power like the Bible. In fact, if you look at it, it, it's its own library with 66 books in it. I'm ho man, I'm holding a library in my hand. I'm stronger than what I thought. <clears throat> but the book of Romans, if you want to change the world, you want to change your lifestyle, you want to change to do something better, the book of Romans is, can get you there. Um, in fact, we use the book of Romans to help us with witnessing and help us with different things in life and the church. And Paul, Paul, Jesus Christ changed his life. And it's, in fact, it says the book of Romans is said to be the constitution of the Christian faith in a lot of ways. And I was, as I was reading this, I was looking at Paul. His very first word, Paul, servant of Jesus Christ. Now as we... Who was Paul? But let me ask that. He was Saul. But what, who was he? A, a Pharisee? A murderer? Can I say he was separated? He was a Pharisee. He didn't live a life of the world. In fact, if, you, if he came in here and you looked at Paul's life, you'd say, man, he is a great Christian. Because, I mean, he did everything right. But he was, he was separated from, but he was never separated unto. And that's where we're different. See, that road to Damascus, that changed everything. That changed who Paul was. I hope everybody here today has had at least one time in their life where they've had a trip on that road to Damascus. And God to see Jesus Christ for who He is. <clears throat> Paul wrote the book of Romans with the help of the Holy Spirit, of course. And, and this book changed the world. Paul wasn't always Paul, of course. We talked about his name being Saul. Named after King Saul of Israel. The name Saul is filled with pride. King Saul was head and shoulders above everyone else. At least that's what he thought. And he was self-willed. He was handsome. And a carnal man. Saul was filled with pride. When we look at, uh, at Paul, Paul was a Jew and a Roman citizen. He was taught in Tarsus. He was fluent in many languages. How many of you can speak more than one language? Okay, who can speak more than just English and Spanish? Okay, yeah, <laughs> see, it's like, everybody raises. 
Just so you can say taco and burrito does not mean you can speak Spanish. <laughs> and those are two of my favorite words. But he's taught by one of the greatest teachers in time, by, at that time, Gamaliel. But he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was a big shot. At least he thought he was a big shot. Because everybody answered to him. And he was going to take the church and persecute the church, wasn't he? Till that road to Damascus. In fact, Martin Luther, when he was going through and raised in the, in the Catholic Church, he was reading the book of Romans when his whole life turned around and a Protestant Reformation was started. But Paul, with all that he changed, with all that he changed his name, to Paul, which means small or little. I don't know too many of us that would change our name to something that means that we're small or little from where we think that we're a big shot. I know when I was naming my children, I was like, man, i got to give my kids the coolest names ever. And then you go by, you know, the, the book. It has like a thousand and one baby names, and you're going through there. And then I remember one, one name was, I think, a Korean name, and it was Suk Chin. And I looked at my wife, I said, hey, can we name our kids Suck Chin? That's like cool. You know, it's like, they're, hey, they're like sucking on their chin, Suck Chin. Yeah, look at Gracie. It was going to be you, Grace, I'm sorry. And um, <laughs> No, we really prayed over the name of our children because we wanted to mean something. And we wanted to, you know, Emily's the only one that didn't come out with a Bible name. We just, you know, it was a name that we loved and, and, uh, my wife loved for a very long time, but then we, I got started getting back into the Bible, and I said, I want Bible names for it, you know. Of course, we sing about grace, the grace of God, you know. And then Nathaniel, prophet, and then Caleb. Caleb, man, he was like a ravaged dog, man. He was ready to go after. He was the one that stood up for what was right. Nobody else was willing to stand up for, except for Caleb and Joshua. So I wanted to mean something. But when Paul became a Christian, he changed his name to be humble. Let's go to, keep your finger right here in Romans chapter 1, but go to Ephesians 3. Ephesians 3 and verse 8. I want you to look at how Paul, after he got saved, how he looked at himself. From being high and mighty and, and thinking all that he was. Ephesians 3, verse 8, it says, Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is the grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Notice what he says, who am less than, than the least of all saints. Go to 2 Corinthians 5. Okay, who put glue on my pages up here? 5, verse 7. Or 17, I'm sorry. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Paul became that new creature. He saw Jesus Christ in a whole new light. He saw who He was. Let me tell you something. If you want to change your life, you want to change everything that's going on, and you don't know how to get out of that rut, cry unto Jesus. Cry unto God. Psalms 40 is one of my favorite psalms. Where it talks about being stuck in a miry clay, in that miry pit. And he cried and God pulled him out, cleaned him off, gave him a new song. Listen, tomorrow, today will be in the past. Tomorrow morning when you wake up, it's going to be a brand new day. Your whole life can change. Everything can change, just like Paul did. He spent three days blind. Why? So God could work in that heart. Sometimes we're blind to our own selves and our own problems. 
But true salvation will humble us. True salvation will see who we are and see who Christ is. But I want us to go back here, Romans chapter 1. Notice here, he was a servant of Jesus Christ. He was a surrendered person. If you want to live a life like you really want and change the world, it doesn't matter how you grew up. It doesn't matter your past. It doesn't matter your parents. You get to make that choice. We've all had problems. We've all had hard lives. But if you want to do something different, then you really got to make that choice and make that change. And you've got to surrender. And I mean you need to surrender, not just, not just pray a prayer. But I mean actually give it all heartfelt and not be an Indian giver and try to get it back. Once you surrender your life, give it to the Lord. He was a surrendered person. This word servant means bond slave. Bond slave is a, a servant who was, he was a slave for a while, but he decided to stay with his master. He wanted to say, you know what, because he loved his master. And after the, the seven years and, and Jubilee, what they would do is that they would go in and talks about in the Old Testament. The servant would go in and they put his head and his ear up against a post and they would put an awe through his ear. And then he would stay with his master for the rest of his life serving him. That's how Paul saw his life with Jesus Christ. He wanted to serve his master. He loved his master. Right now we're going through a, a thing in our society where, you know, we're, everybody's trying to fight racism and the slavery and this and that. None of us know anything about slavery. Can I tell you that right now? With all the past, everything that went on, we have no clue what they did back then. But, can I tell you, everyone is a slave unto something. It could be your life of uh, job, money. Of course, we've got the RU program. It could be an addiction. It could be your pride. It could be who you, just who you are. Sometimes we just got to give up and just do what's right. We all have to take accountability. Either you're a servant of the world or you're a servant unto Jesus Christ. Jesus, or, uh, in John chapter 8, it says, Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever commit a sin is a servant of sin. And the servant abideth not to the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. You know what? If you're a Christian today, you're free. You don't have to sin. I know I, I've heard a lot of people, man, you know, I am saved, I'm a Christian, and I got everlasting life. Then I'm going to sin. Well, let me tell you something. I can sin too. I can do whatever you, I wanted to do. But I don't want to. And if you're a Christian here today and you're deciding to sin, you're deciding to do those things, then you need to get your wonder fixed. Because you shouldn't want to sin. You shouldn't want to live that kind of life. Get that out of your life. Being a servant of Jesus Christ, I said this last week too, doesn't mean that it is now His will instead of my will. It really means that His will is now my will. It's a whole new life. It should be something that we're excited for, that we want every day to help someone, to love someone, to change somebody's life for the better, not for the worse. I don't know about you, but I got my wonder fixed a long time ago. I'm not a perfect person by, by all means. But I want to live a good life. I want to live a good life for my wife and take care of her and take her before the Lord as, as perfect, as best as I can. I want to be able to raise my children the best way I can. Take them before the Lord. And to love them and guide them. Notice here, now Paul was a servant of Jesus Christ, but he was also called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. It says here, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. Paul had a special opportunity and a job that God had for him and him alone. In fact, 
I would say Paul pretty much turned the world upside down himself, didn't he? But was it all by himself? No. No. If I tell you what, we're still talking about him years and years and thousands of years later. He did something great. We all have an opportunity and a job to do. We talked about that this morning in, in Sunday school about the talents. We all have an opportunity and a job to do, but we are not called to the same job. Notice Paul, when he was, his time was up, he says, my course is finished. Each and every one of us has a course to run. Each and every one of us has a job to do. It not, might not be the same, but it's our job to pick up each other and help each other run their course. To encourage them and get them excited. I know when I, when I played soccer, yes, I played soccer. A bunch of smart Alex. I know you're saying, man, you're too fat to play soccer. I swallowed the soccer ball, okay? <laughs> and uh, I was actually fit when I was in school. And uh, that, man, that was 20 some years. Man. Okay, anyway, change the conversation. Um, I remember hearing the crowd cheering, and they're trying to cheer you on, and this and that. But I always heard the coach. It didn't matter how loud that stadium got, I always heard the coach talking. He didn't have to raise his voice very high. But we all had our, our ears toned, right, trained right to the coach to hear what was going on. You know, through our Christian lives, do we have our ears toned to God? You know, sometimes we don't. Man, we keep on wondering why we keep on getting in the same mess and keep on doing the same. You know why? Because you're not listening to the right voice. You haven't been trained yet. A lot of us think we can do it ourselves. We can't. Now, here we go to, I think, the one of the most important parts right here in this verse. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. Now, if you've got a pen, I want you to mark that unto. Unto. We as Christians are separated from the world, and we are to be different than that of the people out there. This should be a hospital. This should be a place that we get healed. Not a place that we come in and we destroy everything. A place that we come in and we, we get help. We get loved on. In many churches, we don't hear about separation anymore. And so instead of being part of the sheepfold, the church becomes a zoo. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17 18, it says, Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. No, sir, it just wasn't sons, it's sons and daughters. It's all of us. But there's time where we need to start separating ourselves from that. That's a big thing in the RU program. But a lot of us, we don't know how to get rid of that past. The sad thing is, it's just not in RU. A lot of us that don't attend RU, we still don't know how to separate the past and that new life. But I want us to look in that separate. And notice the word unto. It is merely being separated from being... It's not, it isn't merely being separated from, but being separated unto. See, it isn't a negative separation, it's a positive separation. Again, Saul, before he became Paul, was separated. He lived a good, holy life, the best he possibly could. But he wasn't separated unto the gospel of Jesus Christ. Many people would say they live a separated life from the world. You can walk a straight and narrow. You don't have to drink. You don't have to smoke. You don't have to do drugs. You don't have to chew. What's that old saying? I don't smoke. I don't chew. I don't go with girls that do. You know, neither does a fence post. So you're telling me that I'm no better than a fence post. Whatever else you can think of, walking straight and narrow, and live the life of a Pharisee just like Paul once did. You realize you can live a separate life and, be, and, and look just like Paul. You can look holy, you can look good, you can talk right, but if you're not separated unto the gospel of Jesus Christ, 
then you're nothing. You still haven't reached the mark. You're still not even on the course. You're not in the race. But notice what he says here now. So in Acts, he saw, now he's in Paul in the next book in Romans, notice what he says now. Now I'm separated unto the Gospel of Jesus Christ. He's a changed man. He never goes back to the way he was. In fact, man, he was going around, he, wanted to, he was changing the world, he was encouraging the churches, encouraging the men, the preachers. Why? Why would anybody do that? For Jesus Christ. He saw, Paul saw the importance of the kingdom of God. He saw who Jesus Christ was. He saw who he was. And he invested his life into, into eternal security. And to that eternal life. And to the kingdom of God. Folks, we don't have much time here on earth. It's almost over. doesn't matter how old you are. The minute, did you know the minute you were born, you started to die? Your skin cells started to come off. Parts of you started to die right away. You know why? Because we live in a world of sin. So well, that's not my fault I was born in a world of sin. No, it, it's not. But you, it doesn't matter. You were. Just because of choice of Adam. We like to blame it on Eve. She didn't help nothing. But Adam was the one. Because when God came and talked to Adam, what did he do? He tried to blame everything on Eve. I know it's hard when we get in trouble or get talked to and we don't want to take accountability. We start pointing fingers. And that's exactly what Adam did. I remember I, I used to do that all the time my, when I was a kid because I didn't like my brother too much. He, he annoyed me. He, He'd go in and do things to me, and he was younger than me, little brat. But uh, not anymore. I mean, we grew up, and now we're, you know, we're very close. But when you're little kids, man, you're just fighting tooth and nail. I was over at a friend's house um, Friday evening. A pastor friend of mine and their kids, and they was telling me about a story that the littlest one, he's three, I think, and the next oldest one is four or five, and he was pounding on his big brother like that. Well, the little three-year-old, he comes over and starts pounding on the next one up. Quit hitting my brother! Quit, quit hitting my brother! In, my, in here, I was like, yeah, I was like, my brother's talking. That or God's talking. We better stop and listen to that right now. Say so he talk about making a preacher mess up, man. You're like, as I know that don't sound like a trumpet, but man, something's going on. Next time, Dean, let's do that trumpet sound. See how many pe people will stand up. All right, told Pastor and Dave. I said, if that rapture comes, I said, you guys are all right. You know, like when they're flying in the plane. I, I remember being up 44,000 feet. We're flying over Iraq, you know, coming back. And I was like, Lord, if you're going to do it, let's do it now. I can get there a lot quicker. <laughs> I'm 44,000 feet above everybody else right now. Here I am. So I'm like, you watch. Those dirty stinkers will be 44,000 feet coming back, and then they're gone. They'll be standing at the gate going, <laughs> we got here first. But this word here, separated, we get that word from the same word that we get our horizon. Our word horizon. Now, as I was looking at it, I was like, why would they translate in that separated? You know why? Because your center point, where you're looking at, gives you your horizon. Where you're standing out, Right here, my horizon has changed because of my center point. I come over here, guess what? My horizon has changed because of my center point. Paul's life changed because his center point was Jesus Christ. 
Once you make Jesus Christ your center point, your whole horizon changes. Your horizon changes completely. Being up in that plane, I remember you could see the curvature of the earth. Up there, and you could see as long as far as you possibly could across the horizon. It was one of the most beautiful things that you could ever see. Made it's amazing what God has created so far up. You guys flew over here from Papua New Guinea, right? I'm sure you didn't take a boat. That would have been a long trip. <laughs> but did you guys look out the window and see that? It was gorgeous. It was beautiful. I remember flying up to Fairbanks to go up to Barry's church up there, Bible Baptist Church, up in Fairbanks. It was named after us, by the way, Barry. Anyway, um, I had the longest sunset from Seattle to Fairbanks that day. It was in April. So the sun started doing its thing where you get more daylight. But I got the longest sunset. It was so beautiful across that horizon. You know, when, we, when I got Jesus Christ, my whole horizon changes. It's still beautiful. Is there days it's rough? Oh, yeah. Oh, my goodness, are there days that are rough. Last, co- last couple months have been the roughest I think I've had in a long time. But God's got me through it because I have to keep focused on my center point and make sure who I'm separating, where I'm standing. Let me ask you this. Is Christ the center of your life? If it's not, you've got some problems. You've got some things that you need to take care of tonight. Don't wait till tomorrow morning when you wake up. Change those things right now. Make it right. After that conference meeting on the road to Damascus, Paul never went back to being Saul. I was thinking about, remember when the Israelis, Israel was having problems in the desert, and they would yell at Moses, said, your God brought us all the way out here to die. Why don't we just go back to Egypt? It's so easy to go back to Egypt. Egypt has always been a picture of the world and sin. It's so much easier to go back to that world. But I have found out now it's not that easy to go back. When you get away from it, it's a lot easier to stay out. I don't want to go back to Egypt. I don't want to go back to the world. I don't want to go back to the way it was. A lot of you guys don't know the life I lived, and you will never know, because, see, I'm not Saul anymore, I'm Paul. That day I accepted Jesus Christ my Savior. It changed. I ran for a little while, but then I made a choice that I did not want to live that life anymore, to live a life that was pleasing to God. Because, see, I found out that my center point, my horizon is Jesus Christ. And then I found out that, hey, I'm not going to be forever here on earth. I have eternal life. I'm going to be in eternity a lot longer than I've ever been here. And I want to live a life that's pleasing to God now. Not wait till I get up there. As we was talking about those talents, God's given us each a talent and each an opportunity. I don't want to wait. I want to get the job done now. I don't want to be the procrastinator. I was a procrastinator most of my life. Ronald Chauncey, you get in there and you clean your room up right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chips is on, Mom. I'm watching chips. You know, and it's just the procrastination of what the job that needed to be done. And by the more and more I waited, the worse it got to go in there and clean up that room. See, there was a time where I had to decide to go ahead and clean up my life. And get right. Let's see here. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12. In verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Notice here, 
It was a joy that was set before him endured the cross. Second Timothy chapter four. Verse seven. Paul here. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Let me ask you again. What is your horizon? Is Christ the center of your life? I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Whatever is going on in your life, whatever is happening, in fact, let's just close our eyes for a minute and bow our heads. Everyone, no looking around. I'm not going to ask you to raise hands or do anything like that right now. I just want you to take some time and spend some time with the Lord right now. Let me ask you, if you died right now, could you say that you fought the good fight? That your course is finished? If you can't, what are you doing? Your life is so precious. God put you on this earth to do something miraculous. To change somebody's life for the better. To please God Himself. Just think about everything. Just think about your heart, your kidneys, your liver, how your body functions. God took time to put all that together just for you and who you are. Don't waste it. Please don't waste your life anymore. Do something great for God. Right now, make this the time. Make the difference now. Why don't we stand? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we are so blessed and we don't even see it. We get blinded by the world. We get blinded by our pride. We can try to look like we're separated. We just get caught. Because we're not separated unto You, our Lord and Savior. Lord, tonight I want everyone. Lord, I'm just asking that You just work in everybody's heart tonight to see where they are and where they stand. There's a time in our lives where we have to be accountable for what we've done. The way we acted. Every single one of us. Every knee shall bow before You, Lord. There's no excuses. There's no excuses up there and that means that there's no excuses down here. Lord, I love You more than anything. I just want to live a life that is pleasing unto You. And I've let a lot of that go. Lord, today I want it to be a new day. I want to make a difference. Lord, You gave us Your book. You gave us the whole library that you wanted us to have. Lord, I just ask that you'll help us read it to understand who you are, to understand who we are. Lord, today I just ask that you'll touch each and every one of us, protect us, protect our flock, protect our church. Lord, as we get ready to go out tomorrow on to a new day at work, Lord, I ask that you help us make it a new day in our life. And that we don't go back to the world it was. Paul never became Saul again. He changed and he was always Paul because he is separated unto you. Make sure our horizon, our center point is focused on you. Lord, I love you and I thank you. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.